My story begins in an airplane bathroom in the fall of 2011. I am halfway between Amsterdam and Johannesburg, cruising at 30,000 feet, when suddenly my breast pump makes a strange noise. If you're a nursing mom, you know this is an essential piece of equipment. And they camouflage these pumps, I suppose, so that casual passerby won't suspect what it is that you are really carrying. And so mine just looks like any regular shoulder bag. And this means that to get at the pump's machinery, I am ripping the black nylon, I am yanking on tubes and wires, and I am desperate to bring this device back to life. Suddenly, the motor makes this high-pitched, whirring noise, and I smell something burning. Now, let me tell you, an airplane is the last place you want to be when you find yourself holding a nondescript black box that is making <laughs> loud mechanical noises and spewing out some kind of smoke. Immediately, I hear knocking at the door, urgent voices demanding to be let in. And so I open the door, and there are three flight attendants, and they look like they are ready for anything. <laughs> it is a tense moment. But then I explain what's going on, what it is that I'm holding, and they see the pained look in my face, and everyone just starts laughing. Except for me. I am staring at this pump hopelessly and thinking, this is my first trip without my infant daughter, and it is already a disaster. So the plane lands, and I get to where I'm going, which is this remote research station in South Africa, and I quickly realize there is no one there I feel comfortable talking about this with. I am isolated by my geography, but also by my colleagues, almost all of whom are men. And in that moment, I feel like I am the only woman in science. Of course, this is ridiculous. But the fact that I felt that way illustrates just how few other moms I knew in my field. I was embarrassed, I felt like I didn't belong, and the only thing I wanted to do was get on the next plane home. What kept me there that day and what saved my sanity were a group of 80-year-old women. These women were the pioneers of NASA. They started their careers in the 1940s as part of an all-female team of mathematicians. When I came across their stories, just by chance while searching for baby names, <laughs> I was struck by the parallels that exist between their lives and my own. These unsung heroes offer a timeless solution for women today. And we are desperately in need of solutions. Women in science are currently facing a perilous situation, particularly in technology. In 1984, 37% of the bachelor degrees in computer science in this country were awarded to women. Today, that number has dropped to just 18%. How do we fix this? The answer lies in this largely unknown group of women who happen to be NASA's first computer programmers. Despite the fact that in 1960, only 20% of moms worked outside the home, these women were able to balance motherhood with exploring the universe over careers that spanned five decades. And the question I am always asked is, how did they do it? The answer is, they did it together. They created their own culture of working motherhood, one that didn't exist in the lab before them. By working as a group, they were able to influence the policies of their employer, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, in Pasadena, California, and even the expectations of their families. Their gift to us are three time-tested strategies. Support each other, change your workplace, trust your partner. It really all starts with the birth of NASA in 1958. That year, when the United States wanted to learn if the first American satellite was a success, they turned to one woman in mission control, Barbara Paulson. But just two years later, when Barbara was pregnant, they turned away. Now, this is 1960. Barbara is 32 years old. At this point, she has worked at the lab for over a decade, and she is now supervisor of her section, managing a large group of women. 
she has feelings that she, with her expertise and her wide experience, she believes that her job is indispensable. So you can imagine how shocked she was when at eight months pregnant, the lab administrators learn she's expecting and they immediately fire her. They tell her that she is an insurance liability and that she needs to pack her things and leave that day. Barbara is devastated. She goes home to her husband and cries, I thought I was worth more than that. Now for most workplaces in mid-century America, this would be it, the end of Barbara's career. Without maternity leave, there was no opportunity for a woman's job to be held for her. Fortunately, Barbara's successor, a woman named Helen Ling, who was also a young mother, had a plan. Under her supervision, the women would hide their pregnancies from the administrators as long as possible. <laughs> and then, when it came time to come back to work after having a baby, Helen would bring them back using a technology we rarely take advantage of today, the telephone. So after a woman would leave to have a baby, they could soon expect a phone call from Helen asking them to come back. And in this way, the women were able to create their own maternity leave and give themselves needed job security. Now, it wasn't enough just to retain their group. They also wanted to grow their numbers. This was not so easy. In the 1960s, the doors of most engineering schools were closed to women. Caltech, for example, didn't open up its engineering program to women until 1970. But there were alternatives. One of them was night school. And so Helen and her team purposefully sought out women with degrees in mathematics, trained them in the lab, and pushed them towards night school. And by doing this, they were able to fill the lab with women engineers who otherwise would never have been hired. Now, it wasn't enough just to change themselves. They had to change their workplace. And in the 1950s and 60s at NASA, most women worked from nine to five with set times for lunch and breaks. And while this traditional schedule works for many, even today, it wasn't ideal for this group of young mothers. And so they took a radical approach. Thanks to their female management, they were able to come and go as needed as long as they got the work done. Now, don't get me wrong, this is the middle of the space race. So by necessity, they are working long hours. During a launch, they are frequently working all night in mission control. But thanks to their flexible schedules, they are able to also take off early one afternoon if they need to care for a sick child or have more time with their families. Now, many NASA centers at the time also imposed a strict no-talking policy for their female employees. Male managers were so worried that their women would just spend all their days gossiping at work. <laughs> As you can imagine, the women of JPL took a very different approach. They became close friends, knowing that these relationships actually strengthened their work. And they also fostered a community environment. This sometimes came about in odd ways, one of which were beauty contests. When I first came across these pictures of the misguided missile contest later, <laughs> I know, it's so crazy, and it was later renamed the Queen of Outer Space. I really, I just couldn't believe that NASA spent decades essentially objectifying their female employees. As ridiculous as the contests are by today's standards, they were one of many events that included barbecues and dances and holiday parties that brought the lab together. And this is actually important because when it came time for the lab to publish their findings in academic journals, the men included their female colleagues as co-authors. This is something that just wasn't done at the time, but was very important to their future career advancement. Now, in my research, I also found that by the mid-1960s, most female mathematicians were fired at NASA centers. They were replaced by IBM computers. At JPL, the opposite happened. It was the women who became the first computer programmers. This did not happen by accident. Female management pushed for early courses both on their lab and at Caltech in computer languages 
And so after Helen learned Fortran, one of these early languages, she then turned around and trained the rest of her group. She had this keen understanding of how the world and its technology was changing. And this training program had an added benefit because it meant that women returning to work after having kids had a clear pathway of how to get back up to speed, no matter how many new computers were coming in the door. So the women made these great strides in changing their workplace. They also had to trust their partners. This seems like it would be simple, but really it isn't. Men of the era typically saw themselves as breadwinners, not caregivers. A 1963 survey found that just 43% of dads had ever even changed a diaper. Imagine then what it was like for this group of women to redefine that relationship. In 1962, Helen Ling returned to work six weeks after the birth of her second child, thanks in part to the equitable way in which she split childcare with her husband. Her husband, Art, worked nights so that he could take on the majority of childcare during the day. And this thinking permeated the group. Many husbands, including Barbara Paulson's husband, Harry, took on the majority of childcare. It was by necessity. These women were launching the first spacecraft to the moon and to the planets. In 1963, Barbara Paulson was working nights and weekends in order to get Mariner 2 off the ground. This is the world's first interplanetary spacecraft. So while Barbara is exploring Venus, it is her husband Harry with his hand literally in the toilet. Remember, this is an era before disposable diapers. And so he is washing cloth diapers and taking on the majority of childcare for their infant daughter. It was undeniably a role reversal for the time, the woman being the primary breadwinner, but it was these moments that made our exploration of the universe possible. A professor I admire once held a picture of my daughter and told me with longing creeping into her voice, you couldn't have kids and be a scientist when I was your age. How different would her life have been had she known Helen Lang? How different would the world be if we could replicate the systematic approach of this group to supporting women in the workplace today? Perhaps no one knows the answer to this better than Sue Finley. Sue is NASA's longest serving female employee. She was hired in 1958 and she still works in the lab today. She credits her long career and her ability to return to work after having kids to her friends. Helen Ling, Barbara Paulson, and this amazing group of women to which she belonged, only a few of which are pictured here. When future generations of women look back to this era, they will certainly shake their heads, much as we do when speaking of what our mothers and our grandmothers endured. But hopefully they will also find a piece of repeating history, women coming together to break boundaries. We do not all have Helens and Barbaras and Sues in our life, but if these women were able to make history 50 years ago, before the Civil Rights Era Act was even passed, imagine what we can do today. What connections can we make with the women around us, and how can that influence alter our workplaces and our personal relationships, perhaps in ways that are radical to our current thinking? I have two young daughters, and I have no idea where life will lead them, but I hope that if they find themselves trapped someplace, be it an airplane bathroom or possibly a laboratory in California, that they will find other women to lean on and to lift up. Thank you. <laughs>